Let's start. Okay, great. So let's start uh, uh, the uh, ninth lecture. Let me switch off my video. So um, uh, at the previous lecture, we proved that every spherical G variety has finitely many orbits. Uh, now uh, I'm going to prove uh, a theorem um, which is uh, converse uh, to the previous one in a sense. The second theorem, is due to Dmitry Achiezer. of uh, 1985. And it says that a homogeneous space Y under the action of a connected reductive group G as usual is spherical. If and only if if and only if any open equivariant embedding of G, any G embedding, say X containing Y as an open orbit, has finitely many orbits. So the theorem is uh, uh, gives you yet another characterization of spherical homogeneous uh, well, space. We, we, we need we need y to be open in x, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I when I speak about G embedding, I mean uh, uh, an algebraic variety with uh, with the action of G such that this given homogeneous space is contained in X uh, as an open dense orbit. So X is supposed to be an irreducible G variety. And Y uh, is supposed to be uh, the open G orbit, the unique open G orbit in X. And uh, this is uh, uh, what I call a G embedding. So this terminology was introduced some, some lectures uh, ago, some lectures, a uh, few lectures before when we uh, defined what is a spherical variety. So yes, Y is supposed to be open in X, of course. Uh, so this is, as I said, this is yet another characterization of spherical homogeneous spaces. And actually, this is an important characterization in terms of this finiteness condition for all equivariant embeddings. Let's turn to the proof of this theorem. Uh, well, actually, the implication uh, from the left to the right, this one, uh, was already proven by the previous theorem. Because the previous theorem says that, so it was theorem one from the previous lecture. This theorem said that every G spherical G variety has finitely many G orbits. And if you are given a spherical homogeneous space, then uh, each of uh, its embeddings, open embeddings, is a spherical G variety. So it has finitely many orbits. The only thing to prove is to the um, is the converse implication from the right to the left. And now we concentrate on the pro on the proof of this uh, converse implication. Uh, uh, so we'll uh, uh, do it in several steps, uh, and uh, we'll argue by contradiction. So let's start the first step of the proof. Suppose uh, that uh, Y is, so we are assuming that uh, every uh, equivariant open embedding of Y has finitely many orbits, and we want to prove that Y is spherical. So suppose it is not the case. Suppose that Y is not spherical. Suppose that Y is not spherical. Uh, well, 
uh, uh, since we uh, uh, argue by contradiction, we uh, want to construct uh, a compactification, uh, well, an embedding, and if we will even construct a compactification, a complete embedding of Y with infinitely many orbits. Now, this is our goal, what we want to do. Um, now, since, um, since uh, Y is not spherical, then by one of the equiv equivalent uh, characterization of sphericality, uh, one uh, by one of these conditions uh, of sphericality, uh, then we have that there exists a line bundle over Y, say L, line bundle over Y, uh, uh, s uh, such that uh, its space of global sections So the representation, uh, so uh, there exists a line bundle. The global uh, sensor is our Y, not our X. Yeah, yes, thank you, thank you, you are right. Thank you, over Y. We have no X so far, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes. So um, uh, the action of G uh, can be lifted uh, to, to this line bundle. And uh, uh, so uh, since, um, uh, since uh, Y is not spherical, there exists a line bundle such that the representation of uh, uh, the representation in uh, the space of global sections of this line bundle is not multiplicity free. This means that this space of sections contains a submodule G submodule, say M. Uh, maybe I'll put it on the next line because I have not enough space here. Let me move it to the next line somewhere here. Okay, so um, uh, there exists a line bundle such that uh, the space of global sections of this L contains a submodule, G submodule, G submodule, which is the sum of two irreducible submodules which are isomorphic to each other, say M prime and M two primes. So that both of these uh, uh, summons are isomorphic to one and the same irreducible G module, uh, say V of lambda, G module of highest weight lambda. Uh, let me denote the isomorphisms uh, from V of lambda to these two uh, submodules in the space of sections, these two isomorphisms. Let me denote them by, say, psi prime and psi double prime, okay? Uh, well, uh, strictly speaking, uh, yeah, as I, as, as I said that we may assume, strictly speaking, uh, we should speak uh, about uh, not G submodules here, but G prime submodules, where G prime uh, is a finite cover of G, because as we know, the action of, uh, of the group G lifts to the line bundle maybe after replacing G with its finite, finite cover. But we also know that uh, we can replace the line bundle with its uh, sufficiently big tensor power such that, that uh, the action of G itself uh, lifts uh, to, uh, uh, to the line bundle. Uh, and of course, um, if uh, uh, the action of uh, the representation of G prime uh, uh, in, in this space where not multiplicity free, then the representation uh, in its tensor power will be still not multiplicity free. So we may assume for simplicity that G itself acts on L. Let me write it here, okay? So we have such a picture. So uh, 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 since Y is not spherical, we have a line bundle over Y, such that uh, uh, the space of global sections of this line bundle contains two irreducible submodules, uh, which are isomorphic uh, to each other, okay? And this gives rise uh, to a morphism, phi from Y 
to the projectivization of the dual space. M star, as we know. Why it is a morphism? Uh, why it is not just um, a rational map? Well, because Y is homogeneous. So uh, uh, the map phi is uh, G equivariant because um, G acts on everything. And uh, the subspace M, which we have chosen, is G stable. And so uh, this map phi is G equivariant. And since it is G equivariant, uh, its domain of definition is G stable. Uh, but Y is uh, a single orbit. So it has to be defined everywhere on Y. This is the explanation why this phi is a morphism, why it is everywhere defined. As for this space M star, uh, let me note uh, that, uh, well, of course, since M is uh, the direct sum of these two subspaces, this M star is isomorphic to the direct sum of its duals. Uh, but we can also represent it in the following way. Uh, so this M star is isomorphic to the tensor product of the dual of V of lambda. This is V of lambda star. Tensor with uh, the two-dimensional vector space. This is the same as the sum of two copies of V of lambda star. Let me again put it on the line below, because here it is too, how to say, too dense. Okay. Okay. So, um, So, uh, uh, let me also recall uh, that, uh, well, maybe it's better to, to do this on the next, on the next sheet of, uh, on the next board. Uh, let me also recall that by Chevalier's theorem, The homogeneous space Y uh, is isomorphic. It can be embedded uh, into the projectivization of uh, the linear representation of G uh, by, uh, as, as an open or as um, an, an orbit, as a quasi-projective uh, subvariety, which is just an orbit of some line in the projectivized. vector space V, okay? Uh, so we have uh, this uh, isomorphism. Y is isomorphic to an orbit in a projective space. Uh, and we may take the closure of this orbit. This gives us uh, an open embedding of Y into a projective G variety. Let me denote it by X. So open embedding. Uh, which is just the closure of this orbit. In the same projective space. Uh, so we have constructed a projective open embedding of Y. But of course, so far we do, do not know how many G orbits it contains. Uh, but what we can say, uh, uh, now this map phi, which we have seen on the previous page, uh, can be regarded as a rational map from this uh, x uh, to the projectivization of m star. So we had a morphism from y to this projectivized vector space, to this pro projective space. And uh, this morphism uh, can be considered as a rational map from X to the same projective space, because Y is an open subset of X. OK? Uh, now uh, let's consider uh, the diagonal map 
uh, let me denote it, uh, uh, say, by big phi. Big phi is the product of two maps, the identity map on X and the map phi, which I considered before, small phi. So this is a map. This is, again, a rational map from X to the direct product of X with this projective space P of M dual. Uh, so we have uh, the identity map on the first factor and phi on the second factor. Or explicitly, if you like, we can write that phi big phi of x is a pair consisting of x itself and small phi of x. So this is again a rational map. But now we, make, uh, we can take the image of this map and we can take the closure of this image. And if we replace x uh, if we replace x with the closure of the image of this big phi, this is a sub-variety. Now it is a closed sub-variety, a projective sub-variety in the product of x and this p of m star. Okay? Uh, so, um, uh, X contains Y as an open orbit, and this Y is still embedded into this guy. Uh, this is still an open embedding. Because uh, the map uh, phi, which we had before, small phi, uh, was a morphism from Y uh, to this projective space uh, P of M dual. Uh, and if we take uh, this uh, in this formula, if we take this uh, uh, small x belonging to Y, then gives, uh, this gives you an embedding of Y into, uh, into this product variety. So uh, replacing x with the closure of the image of big phi, uh, we obtain yet another open embedding of Y. But now we have a projection map from this uh, product variety to the second factor. We have a projection map uh, to this uh, pi of m, to this p of m dual projection. Uh, and therefore, uh, well, uh, actually, uh, uh, this projection map composed with this embedding of Y into this uh, closed image uh, gives back uh, the map phi, small phi, uh, on Y, which we had before. So uh, what we have done, uh, we have embedded Y as an open orbit in a projective variety. We have embedded Y as an open orbit in this projective variety. But now uh, this projective variety uh, uh, has a map onto this projective space, which extends the map phi from Y. So maybe let me write it as a commutative diagram. So we have the map, the, compo the composition map here, the composed map is just the map phi, which we started with. So this means that uh, we may assume, we may assume uh, that uh, the map phi extended to X. So phi was a morphism from Y to this projective space and the extended is as a rational map on X. But now by replacing X with this guy, we may assume that phi is actually a morphism on X. Okay. Uh, 
And this, uh, uh, this uh, is uh, the first step of the proof. So uh, let me repeat what we have done. Uh, uh, supposing that y, that the homogeneous uh, space y is not spherical, we have constructed uh, a projective open embedding of y, this, uh, this variety x, uh, equipped with a morphism, an equivariant morphism onto the projective space which is the projectivization of uh, the linear representation of G, this M star, which is the sum of two copies of one and the same uh, irreducible uh, G module. This is what we have done. Okay. So any questions so far? Uh, if not, then uh, let's turn to the, the second step of the proof. Professor, you say yes, please. why we may mm -hmm. assume that x is a the phi is a morphism. Uh, let me yeah yeah let me repeat that uh, uh, let us replace uh, the initial x which we have uh, constructed which comes from the Chevalier theorem this one. Let me replace this x uh, with this variety. Uh, this variety uh, is still an open embedding of y. Uh, because uh, the composition map, uh, so if you uh, if you restrict your map big phi uh, on the open orbit y, if you take this point x from y, uh, then you get this pair. So uh, this map phi embeds y in this product variety. Okay, uh, embeds um, as a locally closed uh, sub variety. Uh, and uh, this means that y is uh, 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 can be considered as an open orbit in here. But uh, now we have a map, a regular map, a morphism from this variety on uh, to the uh, projective space P of M dual, right? Because it is just uh, this variety is contained in here, and here you have just a projection map, which is a morphism. Uh, and if you restrict this projection map on this guy, if you restrict it on y, which is embedded in this guy uh, by this formula, so when you restrict the projection onto the second factor, you just get the map small phi. Uh, this makes this diagram commuting. Okay? So uh, we started from an open embedding x of y, uh, uh, and uh, this morphism phi uh, on the open orbit uh, extends to a rational map from X to the same projective space. But now, if we replaced X with this guy, uh, uh, on this guy, we have a morphism. This projection map is a morphism, which still extends this map phi. So this is why, uh, after this replacement, we can assume uh, that phi is a morphism. Okay, did I explain? Hey, Professor, mm -hmm. I want to ask a question about the composition of M. Uh, 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 M is isomorphic to the sum of uh, two V lambda, right? Yes. Well, a lambda, uh, is lambda a, a linear representation of H? Uh, no, no, lambda is the highest weight. Lambda is the highest weight. It is a, a, a vector in the character lattice uh, of of the Borel subgroup of G or, oh, or the maximum of, of G. Yes, this is this is my standard notation uh, for uh, an irreducible I, 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 representation I, I, of G. I know, but but why mm. is not why is not the general flag variety? So no, how, no, no, how... no, no, no. Of course, of course. Why is not a flag variety? Why is just a homogeneous space? Why is uh, a homogeneous so... space? Why is uh, G mod H, G over H? It is a homo it is a homogeneous space which we are assuming to be not spherical now. Oh, so 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 we have a uh, a uh, uh, G acting on the line bundle L. So so the section is a G model that can decompose, right? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And since y is not spherical, there exists uh, such a line bundle uh, that this uh, representation in global sections is not multiplicity free. 
And this is exactly the statement that it is not multiplicity free. It contains two isomorphic uh, irreducible submodules. Isomorphic, but uh, not, not the same. Okay. Okay. So, well, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I need some time to digest. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, if, if you if you uh, uh, have further questions, then of course, uh, please ask me. Uh, well, but uh, now let me. Okay. Uh, a homogeneous line bundle over Y uh, uh, is related to. I think, uh, it is really a homogeneous uh line bundle over G quotient by H is related to a linear representation of H. Uh, uh it it is related to a character of H. Uh, it yes, is it something is like this. Something like this. We have written uh, it like this. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, oh, so. The G acting on L uh, is is by uh by the uh by the theorem that uh L tensors itself many times. Yes, yes. Uh, there was a theorem, uh, well, a corollary of another theorem yes, that yes, uh, I, I know, I know, mm -hmm. I remember that. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. So, more questions. Well, if not, then let's continue. If you don't mind, let's continue. So let's turn to the uh, next step of the proof. Uh, excuse me. I think that I have... a super first page here, so let me... Okay. Um, uh, let me turn to the second step of the proof. This is just about representation theory. So uh, uh, we have this, uh, yeah, we have this uh, irreducible G module V of lambda of highest weight lambda, and let me consider let me consider the action of the maximal torus T uh, on this uh, vector space V of lambda. Uh, any representation of an algebraic torus is diagonalizable. In particular, this one is diagonalizable. This means uh, that uh, there exists a basis uh, in this vector space V of lambda consisting of eigenvectors for the action of T. And uh, let's choose such a basis. So choose uh, a basis of V of lambda consisting of the vectors V0, V1, etc. Vn, basis of uh, V of lambda, such that every basis vector is an eigenvector. So each of these VIs is an eigenvector uh, for the action of T uh, with some eigenweight with eigenweight uh, say lambda I which is some character of the maximal torus. So it sits in the character lattice of the maximal torus T, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, we may assume that uh, one of these weights is the highest weight of, uh, of this uh, representation, say, uh, let lambda naught be equal to lambda. It is the highest weight. And the respective vector v naught is the highest weight vector. Okay. 
So uh, we choose a basis consisting of eigenvectors uh, for the t action such that the first uh, one of the basis vectors is the highest weight vector for this representation. Uh, then we have the following lemma, which is actually standard for the representation theory of reductive groups, but let me prove it for you because the proof is simple. Uh, just to make our lectures more consistent, more self-consistent. So this lemma says that uh, all of these uh, eigenweights, all of these lambda i's, are obtained from the highest weight lambda by subtracting finitely many uh, positive roots, say alpha 1, etc., alpha k, uh, where alpha j are just positive roots. Uh, and k is a natural number, a positive integer. So this holds for any k, for any i from any y from 1, ranging from 1 to n. So briefly speaking, uh, all eigenweights uh, for the maximal torus uh, on the, uh, in the irreducible representation of G uh, are obtained from the highest weight by subtracting positive roots. Okay? Uh, how to prove this lemma? Well, but we does not have a canonical choice of positive roots. Uh, well, of course, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we have to make some choices, several choices. So uh, given a connected reductive group G, we first choose a Borel subgroup, one uh, among all conjugates. Yeah, we have chosen this B. And we also choose a maximal torus sitting in this B. It is again, uh, it, it, it again can be chosen up to conjugation. So uh, having this choice made, the set of positive roots is well defined. It corresponds to the uh, root to the root subspaces uh, sitting in the Lie algebra of the Borel subgroup. Okay. Of course, this is up to up to these choices. Oh yes, I, I see. And in particular, when we speak about the highest weight and highest weight vector, uh, uh, we relate it to the chosen Borel subgroup. It is with respect to the chosen Borel subgroup. Okay. So, uh, how to prove the lemma? Uh, let me remind you that uh, uh, this uh, connected reductive group G contains an open cell, open big cell, which is just the product of B minus the opposite uh, Borel subgroup with B. It is an open subset in G. It is called the open cell, the big cell. Uh, and uh, since uh, both of these two Borel subgroups, B minus and B, contain one and the same maximal torus T, actually T is just the intersection of B minus and B, uh, this open cell can also be written as the product of U minus with B, where U minus is the unipotent part of B minus. Now, Uh, the vector space V of lambda, this uh, represent this uh, irreducible G module V of lambda of highest weight lambda, uh, since it is irreducible, it is uh, the linear span of any of orbits sitting in this module. Say we can take, for instance, we can take the highest weight vector V naught, we can take uh, the G orbit of V naught, and we can take the linear span of this G orbit. And by irreducibility, we get the whole of V of lambda. We get the whole space. Because this, is, this linear span, span is an invariant subspace in here. And it has to coincide with the whole of V of lambda. Uh, thanks to the above, uh, to the above formula, uh, and since well, uh, I don't B. I understand this. How, how can we deduce this? Uh, because uh, because uh, this guy, this linear span, is a G-stable subspace. Oh. G stable subspace. 
So it is a sub module of V lambda, I think. I think. And this is irreducible, okay? Yes, yes, yes. Good. So now, uh, if we recall that uh, the line spanned by the highest weight vector V0 is stable under B, so when B acts on this V0, uh, when B acts on this V0, it just multiplies this V0 by the character lambda, by the highest weight. So we can write this linear span also uh, as follows. This is the same as the linear span of the u orbit, of the u minus orbit. u minus orbit of v naught. Because of the above decomposition, because this, uh, this uh, u minus uh, times b, or b minus times b, is a dense open subset in G. Dense and open subset in G. Okay, uh, and now uh, since u minus is a, a unipotent group, since u minus is a unipotent group, it is uh, the exponential image of its Lie algebra. And the Lie algebra of u minus is the direct sum of root subspaces corresponding to all negative roots. Or in other, uh, uh, other way around, it is the direct sum of root subspaces uh, corresponding to, to the roots which are opposite to the positive roots. So negative roots are opposite to positive roots, okay? So uh, every element in this Lie algebra is the sum of uh, root vectors corresponding to, to, to these uh, roots minus alpha. And when, when we exponentiate such a sum and apply it uh, to this, uh, to this um, uh, highest weight vector V0, uh, then we get something like this. We get, um, uh, we get uh, E minus alpha 1 uh, times etc. times E minus alpha k applied to v naught, uh, and all the all linear combinations of these guys. So our um, uh, our vector space is just the linear span of all these vectors, of all vectors of this kind. So k be, k may be any non-negative integer, and this alpha i's can be any positive roots. Like this. Well, what is E minus alpha i? Uh, excuse me? What is your question? Can you repeat? What What is the, the character E refers to? Uh, let me let me remind you that uh, let me remind you that the root each um, each root subspace, say G minus alpha, is one dimensional and it is generated by one uh, element yes. of the Lie algebra denoted like this. I know. So this uh, E sub minus alpha one minus uh, alpha k are these root vectors. Okay. Uh, are the exponential of this root vector right? No, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, well, uh, uh, let me uh, let me uh, give you a bit more details. So, um, if you have any element in here, then this guy is a sum, a linear combination, better to say, linear combination, something like this: c sub alpha times e sub minus alpha over all alpha. And when the, when you exp exponentiate this guy, when you exponentiate this guy, well, when you exponentiate, we get an element in the Lie group, U minus. 
uh, it can uh, have uh, different matrix realizations. But uh, what we are interested in, we are interested in how this exponent acts uh, on the uh, vector V0. And it acts by exponentiating the action of this guy. So it is the exponentiation of the sum over alpha C alpha E minus alpha applied to V0. And this exponent can be uh, computed by the usual exponential, uh, uh, as the usual exponential series. Yeah. So I think and this, this gives you this this uh, this summons. The, so I think the the e minus alpha i in the bracket should be the exponential of of the vector, not the vector. no 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 these uh, this e uh, is not uh, doesn't stand for exponential. This e stands for this root vector. When you exponentiate, you just multiply. Well, you take this sum this sum to some power and expand this uh, uh, power. And when you expand the power of this sum, when you compute the exponential series, series you get summons like this, OK? With oh, some coefficients, oh, of wait, course. Wait, wait. The product here is the matrix product, right? Yes, yes, yes. It is a oh, matrix product. So oh, the products. I, mm -hmm. I was thinking of vector, and I was, I was confused about the product of vector. Well, if okay. you see, see them as matrix, then, then this Yeah, 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 yeah. So only this last product, only this last product is the product of a matrix and a vector. So this is a vector, this is a matrix. So this is a product of a matrix and a vector. And these products are products of matrices, OK? Is it clear now? Well, so um, what we get? We get that, again, let me say that we get that uh, this linear span is the same as this linear span. And now we see that uh, we see that uh, the uh, vector space V of lambda is spanned by the vectors of this type, right? Uh, and each of these vectors, each of these vectors is an eigenvector uh, for T whose eigenweight, whose eigenweight is the sum of eigenweights of all these factors because uh, uh, the weights are written uh, additively in the additive notation. So these, um, uh, these uh, weights uh, sum up. And so V0 has uh, the weight lambda, and these uh, root vectors, E minus alpha i's, have the weights which are these roots, minus alpha i's. So what we get, let me, let me write it here, that it is a, a T eigenvector, T eigenvector with eigenweight with eigenweight lambda minus alpha 1 minus etc minus alpha k so what we finally get is uh, that um, is that all T eigenweights uh, are of the form which was just written. Lambda minus alpha one minus etc. minus alpha K. And this proves the lemma. This proves the lemma because the lemma said explicitly that uh, all weights uh, of the representation of T, excuse me, all weights of the representation of T in this uh, irreducible uh, G sub module are of this form. And only one of these weights with multiplicity one is the highest weight. Because um, among these vectors, among these vectors, only one vector has the weight lambda itself. Uh, when this k is zero, when when we do not apply anything, uh, 
when we do not apply, apply any of the root vectors to V0, then we get a V0 itself when K is zero. And this so, has the weight lambda. Mm -hmm. So we conclude that uh, all of all of the T's eigen vector is of this form because the span of this vector is the whole space, right? Oh uh, well, <laughs> I cannot say that all of T eigenvectors are of this form because some of these T eigenvectors may have the same weight, and then we can take the sum of these vectors, and it will be again, it will be still a T eigenvector. Uh, yes. But what we can say, we can say that a V lambda is spent by T eigenvectors of this form, and this means that all eigenweights are of this form, and we can oh. choose a basis. We can choose a basis of my vector space V of lambda from these vectors. This is what we can say. Okay. Uh, so, so this is, uh, so the lemma is about any choice of eigenbases, but you prove that uh, some choice of eigenbases. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, uh, the lemma is about any choice of eigenbases, and indeed there are different eigenbases, but the set of eigenweights is, is one and the same. So the set uh, of eigenweights well, doesn't depend on doesn't depends uh, on the choice of of the basis, right? So, uh, so, mm -hmm. and so for any other eigenspace. Uh, uh, it is the linear com uh, combination of, of of the form, so uh, its eigen character should be. Ex uh, yeah, I mean, I I mean any other eigenbasis, any other eigenbasis uh, is combined from linear combinations of these vectors, but the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues, the eigenweights will be the same. The eigenvalues do not depends on the do not depend on the choice um, of the basis. As you know, so there may be different bases, but the eigenvalues are one and the same. So the set of eigenweights is um, uh, is independent of, on the choice of the basis, right? Okay, so um, uh, let me maybe finish. Um, let me finish the uh, second part of the proof and the first half of my lecture by the following. So we have proved the lemma, and now uh, uh, let us choose uh, a vector lambda, a, a vector gamma uh, in the dual lattice. So we have the character lattice lambda, big lambda, and we may take the dual lattice lambda star. Uh, and choose a vector a gamma in this dual lattice such that the pairing of gamma with all positive roots is positive. Let me briefly explain wh wh why we can do this because, uh, because um, I mean, uh, 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 let me remind you how how do you choose uh, positive and negative roots? So when you have a root system, when you have a root system, uh, this is a finite co finite collection of uh, vectors, yeah, finite collection of vectors uh, in the character lattice of T. Say this one, this one, this one, and the opposites. This one. This is the wrong one. Let me write it better. Try it better this one, and maybe this again. Let me do it better. And this one. So if we have uh, uh, this set of roots uh, in the character lattice, then how how do we choose positive roots? Uh, we take a hyperplane. We take a hyperplane uh, in uh, in the vector space spanned by the character lattice. Draw it in green, like this. Yeah. 
So we choose a hyperplane. Say, uh, let it be H, script H, which do which does not contain any uh, uh, any root. And this hyperplane divides uh, the whole uh, uh, vector space into half spaces. And the set of positive roots uh, uh, is uh, this, the set of roots contained in one of these half spaces, say uh, in the upper half in the upper half space in this picture. So this is delta plus. And how this hyperplane is defined? Uh, it is defined by a linear equation. So we can choose a linear function a vector actually sitting in the dual space, in the dual vector space. So this vector, excuse me, let me draw it like this. A vector sitting in the dual a vector space, but I, uh, uh, I uh, draw it on, on the same uh, picture, this one, okay? Uh, this is, uh, gamma which defines you this hyperplane uh, this gamma is a vector in the uh, rational vector space over rational numbers dual to the uh, rational span of the lattice lambda but if we multiply this gamma with uh, some positive no multiple then um, uh, actually we can get a lattice vector so this gamma can be uh, viewed as the lattice vector the, the vector in the dual lattice. And this vector, by, by construction, this vector satisfies the property that its pairing with uh, all positive roots is positive. Okay. Uh, and now let me uh, associate a one parameter multiplicative subgroup with this gamma. So multiplicative one parameter subgroup, one parameter. Uh, multiplicative subgroup, uh, which I denote, uh, well, what, what is a one parameter multiplicative subgroup? It is a homomorphism from the multiplicative group of the field to the maximal torus T. Let me denote this map as T is mapped to T to the power gamma. This is the image of T from k star, from k cross, uh, to this, uh, under this uh, homomorphism. And this, uh, this element t to the power gamma in, in big T is characterized by the property. So this is an element such that uh, the value of any character mu on this element equals to uh, t to the power the pairing of gamma with mu. So an element of a maximal torus is characterized by the values of all characters on it, because uh, these characters include, for instance, coordinate functions uh, or, or on a torus. This is for any mu in the character lattice. So in a more explicit way, you can write it like this. So if your T is represented as a product of several copies of T star, of K star, K cross, say M copies of K cross, then uh, then uh, this uh, T to the, to the gamma is just a tuple of uh, non-zero scalars t to the k1, etc., t to the km, where these ki's are just pairings of gamma with basic characters of uh, of this torus t. So these epsilon i's, I already used this notation. So epsilon i's are coordinates on T. So 
So this is the explicit form of this one parameter subgroup corresponding to a vector in the dual lattice of characters. Okay, so having this introduced, let me stop the first half uh, of uh, the lecture right now. And again, I'm sorry for shifting the break. So now we have a 10 minutes break as usual. And if you have questions, then please ask your questions. Any questions so far? So when we talk about the group action on, uh, for example, a line bundle, we often consider it's a finite covering. So the G prime, right? Uh, uh, you mean here? No, at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. This is the very beginning. So uh, yes, uh, if you take an arbitrary line bundle on Y, then what we, what you can guarantee, you can leave the action of G on Y to the action of G prime on lambda on L on L. Yeah. So for example, if this G is simply connected, then. If G is simply connected, then you can lift, yeah, then you can lift the action of G itself. But even if uh, G is not simply connected, you can replace lambda by, uh, you can replace L, not lambda, L, by its tensor power and get the action of G itself lifted to, to L, okay? Uh, so by both methods, you can always assume that uh, maybe you can replace G by a G prime and uh, you, yeah, I, I mean, you can replace G by G prime, but I would better replace L by L to some tensor power. I don't want to change G here. Uh, I want to change L. But of course, uh, uh, the other way around, you can change G. You can replace G with G prime and then uh, say the same <laughs> as we did here. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, uh, more questions? Uh, so for well, homogeneous, yes, for homogeneous line bundle over Y, we have an uh, I mean a homogeneous line bundle over Y. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, a homogeneous line bundle over Y already admits a G action. Uh, yes, yes, of course, of course, but uh. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> so well, we do yes. not choose homogeneous line bundle here, right? We just choose, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think you are right that uh, it's but, better to formulate but, but it like this. The, the creation for uh, homogeneous, uh, for spherical homogeneous space, uh, just need, uh, the uh, uh, well, uh, uh what is uh, uh uh, uh, the criteria criteria for uh homogeneous uh spherical spherical homogeneous space just need to verify uh the homogeneous line bound. So yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, so you are right. You, you are right. Uh, 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 I, 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 uh, I explained it here. Maybe not, uh, not appropriately. Yes, indeed. So if you are assuming then that Y is not spherical, then by this uh, criterion of sphericality, there should exist a homogeneous line, G line bundle, yeah, a homogeneous line bundle over Y, uh, such that uh, this uh, property holds. So it is so not it an assumption. Need, so it do not need uh, to assume that G acts on L. Right, right, right. Maybe, maybe I, should, uh, I should erase it from here. So uh, I should not say this because it is just by by criterion of sphericality. It comes automatically. So uh, you choose L in such a way that G already acts on X. So uh, uh, let me let me remove that. We may assume that G just acts on L. Yeah. This is this is uh, what you have said. Okay. This is just by, by criterion of sphericality that you can choose such an L equipped with the action of G. You are right. You are right.
So, uh, more questions or comments? Uh, well, if not, then let me uh, switch uh, off the microphone for the left five minutes of the break. But if you have, uh, if you ha still have questions, then I am here, so you can ask the questions if you have. But let me switch off the microphone for five minutes. Okay. Well, I do have a question about uh, uh, the last page. Professor? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I do have a question about the last page. So the map is uh, T maps to uh, uh, the power, uh, the, the K1 power of T, the K2 power of T, uh, and the Km power of T, uh, the last line. Yeah. Ah, so uh, how can we as assume that uh, the the k1 power of t lies in the multiplicative group of k if k1 is not an integer? Int yeah, it is integer because 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 gamma is the vector in the dual lattice. It is the lattice vector. So the oh, pairing dual of lattice. Oh, so it is yeah, not yeah. The dual space or dual lattice. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can choose if we, we can choose with this vector be a lattice vector because initially it, it was in the dual space, but you can multiply it with a positive integer such that uh, you get a lattice vector. The space is over rational numbers, so you can multiply any of, the, of its vectors uh, by a sufficiently big integer to get uh, a lattice vector. Okay, so indeed, these guys, uh, these guys are integers. These numbers are integers. This was your question? Yes, this was my question. Uh. Okay.
Oh, well, uh, I think we can continue with the proof of um, Achiezer theorem. So uh, uh, this was the second uh, step in our proof. And now comes uh, the third step, which will be the last step. Let me turn uh, the page. Uh, so um, recall uh, that we have chosen uh, a basis uh, in the uh, irreducible representation space of highest weight lambda, uh, a basis consisting of eigenvectors, such that uh, the first basis vectors, uh, denoted as V0, uh, is the highest weight vector. And also recall uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, two copies of this V of lambda in the uh, space of sections, uh, in the space of global sections um, uh, of the line bundle over Y, uh, which we also uh, extended, which we also extended to the whole of X. So since we are now assuming that this phi is a morphism from the projective embedding X of Y, to this vector space, uh, to this projective space P of uh, M star, uh, then uh, you know, this uh, space M, this space M of uh, global sections is actually a space of sections in uh, on X. So maybe I, I should better write it here. So, uh, so recall, that uh, we have uh, an embedding of Y, an open embedding uh, in a projective variety X, uh, equipped with a morphism phi to the projectivization of M star, where uh, uh, so what is M? M is a subspace, is a G submodule in the space of global sections of some line bundle L over X. It is the sum of two irreducible submodules M prime and M double prime, both of which are isomorphic to V of lambda. And these isomorphisms We denoted them as, uh, let me write it here, as psi prime and psi two primes. And this M star can be written as the tensor product of, uh, maybe I should write it rather, rather here. So uh, this M star can be written as the tensor product of V of lambda star, the dual reducible G module, and the two-dimensional vector space K to the two. Okay. So uh, now uh, we take this basis uh, of V of lambda, which we have chosen here. Uh, and we consider the respective bases in these two uh, summons, M prime and M double prime. So we introduce uh, the sections, uh, which I denote, say, uh, S i prime. It is by definition psi prime of V i. It is a section sitting in M prime. And similarly, S i double prime will be the image of this V i under psi double prime. This will be a section sitting in here. Okay. Uh, this means that uh, the set of all these sections, that is S not prime, S not double prime, S one prime, S one double prime, etc. S n prime, 
S N double prime is a basis of M is a basis of M. Uh, and uh, this basis consists of uh, eigenvectors for the action of T. Uh, uh, what we are interested in, we are interested in uh, how this one parameter subgroup T to the, to the gamma acts on these sections. Well, it acts via uh, eigenweights. So uh, T to the gamma applied to the section S i prime uh, is the same as equals, well, equals T to some power uh, L i times S i prime. Well, this L i uh, yeah, and uh, similarly, maybe, uh, maybe, I should, I should write the similar formula for uh, the action of this one parameter subgroup on SI double prime with the same weight. So we have the same scalar multiple t to the li times si double prime. Well, these li's are pairings of gamma with lambda i's. So they are integers. And actually, since each of these lambda i's, let me recall you that uh, each of these lambda i's is obtained from lambda by subtracting positive roots. And our uh, uh, vector gamma in the dual lattice uh, is, uh, takes positive values on positive roots. So this means that um, L0 is greater, strictly greater than L1, etc. Ln. OK? So this is how this one parameter subgroup acts uh, on the basis uh, of M consisting of these uh, eigenvectors for, for, for the maximal torus T. Okay? And now uh, let us take any point. So um, maybe let me organize it a little bit differently because I need some, I want to save, save some space here. Excuse me. I want to move it to another to another position on the board. So let me do it like this. So Here, here, and here. It's okay now. So uh, now uh, let me take any point in X, any point in X. And for any point in X, uh, let me consider the orbit uh, of this point under the one parameter subgroup defined by gamma. So uh, what, what I do, I apply T gamma to x, and I take the image uh, of this orbit under the map phi uh, into this projective space, P of m star. So uh, since the map phi is equivariant, uh, this is the same. Again, maybe it, it, it would be better to write it 
I want to save some space here. It's better to write it on this line. So um, uh, since uh, phi is equivariant, it is the same as applying t to the gamma to the image of x. OK? And now what is it? How can we compute this? Uh, well, uh, these sections, uh, S not prime, S not double prime, etc., uh, can be viewed as the homogeneous coordinates, as the projective coordinates uh, on this projective space. So this uh, uh, point phi of x uh, can be uh, given by uh, its projective coordinates, which are just the values of these sections at the point x. And when you act by this uh, element in the maximal torus, then um, since uh, uh, these uh, sections are eigenvectors uh, for the action of t and for the action of t gamma, uh, then uh, these coordinates are just multiplied by some weights. Let me write how it will look. So it is equal to the following. It, it will, will get a point in the projective space with the following coordinates. Uh, t to the minus L naught times S naught prime of X, t to the minus L naught times S naught double prime of X, uh, et cetera. Why there is minus? Why it is minus? It is a good question because uh, let, let let me answer. Yeah. So why it is minus? Uh, because uh, oh, 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 when you act on a function, you act on the argument of, of, of the function uh, by the inverse element of the group. So now uh, uh, let's look at the previous line. You act on the point by the element uh, t of t of gamma, t t to the gamma, t to the gamma. This means uh, that you act uh, on the coordinate on the coordinate function by the inverse element on, of this group, uh, and that's why this but minus that, is that, that, that doesn't we, that doesn't we apply t gamma to the point phi x. Exactly, we apply t gamma to the point uh, uh, to the point phi x, so, and this so, means, yeah. So, so t gamma acting on phi, uh, t gamma acting on the project device m star uh, yes. by e minus yes because because uh, these guys are the basis of m and their weights are these weights these powers and uh, the weights uh, in the dual basis of m star are uh, inverse or opposite uh, in the additive notation that's why these minuses uh, appear here Well, just think about the definition of the action uh, uh, of, the, of the linear representation in the dual vector space. You, you will see that the inverse elements will appear here. OK? So, so the second uh, last line, right? Hmm? So the second Stay last line. Uh, Sec uh, equals to t gamma phi x. So, so, so what do you mean by this? Uh, so on, on the right hand side, you mean uh, the t gamma actually with the action on phi. This is a this is a function, right? Well, well, uh, actually, uh, the group acts, acts everywhere. So a phi of x is a point in this projective space. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, everything acts on this projective space. So the group G itself acts here. The maximal torus T acts here. And the one parameter subgroup in the maximal torus T also acts here, right? Okay. So this is just the action uh, in this sense. The action oh, so, of this. So, so, so the value of S naught prime at GX uh, is G, G minus Y actually on uh, S naught prime, the value of S naught prime acting on X. Oh, well, well, uh, no, no. I mean, uh, the value uh, if if you act uh, if you act uh, by um, how to say? I mean, uh, x is not a uh, five of x is not uh, a stable point. So uh, you can you cannot say that uh, you cannot say that uh, the value uh, of this section is preserved by t. 
because of the value of this section, when you oh. act by T, you get to a different fiber of the line bundle. Uh, oh. Oh. So, the so, section, so, yeah. So, so, so the, uh, uh, so uh, T gamma acting on SI prime, and the right, the right is the, uh, the power of T. Uh, this is multiplication or action. This is multiplication, and this is action. And this is this is a multiplication. Yes, this is a multiplication. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it is not this multiplication. It, it, it is just multiplication. It is not the action. I cannot say that uh, the value of this section at the point X is stable under T or is multiplied by. Well, I mean, uh, when you act by T or by T to the gamma, you just get to the different fiber, to a different fiber, yes, to I a know, fiber over another point. But so. Uh, uh, so this makes value, sense. So, 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 for, 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 so like uh, the value of, of S at uh, GX uh, is, uh, is, is G minus Y uh, acting on SX. Uh, well, uh, how do you say that? The value of S at GX. The value of S uh, at GX. Uh, is, well, uh, is, is G minus Y acting on SX? Uh, well, uh, I would say that this is um, the same as uh, the value. Of, so so, so let, let me say like this. Let me say like this. Uh, you take GS at oh, G GX and then you apply she like G this, is. like this. So uh, this GS uh, 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 is a section of, of your line bundle, and you evaluate it at this point, at the shifted point, and it is the same as, um, yeah, it is the same as, uh, or did I, did I write it? Uh, well, let, 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 let me write differently maybe like like this so by definition uh, uh what is the action on sections so if you want uh, to act by a group element on a section then you get another section whose value at the point at the shifted point is the same as the value of the initial section at the initial point and then you shift this value by G. Uh, so here G is applied to the value of S on X. Yeah. Uh, and you get to a different fiber. You get to the fiber of this point. And you get by definition uh, the uh, value of this shifted section on, on the shifted point. So uh, if you want to compute uh, the uh, value S of GX, then it is the same as uh, G shift of the value of G inverse X, G inverse uh, S at X. So this is the formula. And again, you see here this inverse. So this is yet another explanation why this minus occurs here. Okay. Well, let, let me finish this digression. I think I'll erase it from the notes, but so far let me keep it here. Uh, well, so uh, uh, so let me finish this formula in, in coordinates. So you have this, uh, uh, this point with projective coordinates given by this, uh, by these values t to the minus L naught times S naught prime of X, t to the minus L naught times S naught double prime of X, et cetera. And finally, t to the minus, excuse me, different color, t to the minus Ln times S n prime of X, uh, t to the minus Ln times S n double prime of x. 
so this is the formula uh, for uh, for the image uh, of uh, under pi of this orbit uh, in projective coordinates. And now uh, let's make t tend to zero. So uh, we now uh, we now send t to zero. What will be the limit of this uh, curve when uh, t tends to zero? Well, uh, uh, if if the field k is not is not normed, how how do you that the limit of t? Well, it is a good question. Uh, how do you understand the limit? As follows. So, uh, what is this guy? Uh, this guy can be considered, uh, can be regarded as a map from the punctured uh, from the punctured affine line. Uh, to to this projective space, yeah. So you get a map from the punctured affine line uh, with this uh, point removed to this projective space. Uh, uh, and what is the limit? Uh, we say that uh, this map has a limit at this point if this map can be extended to the map of the whole affine line. So you you can define how how to how to write it here. Let me let me let me write it like this. So you have this excluded point, this one, yeah. Uh, and the question is whether you can uh, extend your map to a regular map on the whole affine line. And then the image of this point will be uh, the limit, uh, the limit point here. Okay. Uh, if you uh, if you can extend the map from the punctured affine line to the whole uh, affine line, then by definition, uh, the image of the uh, added point uh, will be the limit. Uh, in the natural sense, the limit uh, of this of this map as t tends to zero. So this is this is the zero point. Okay, this is how this limit can be understood in terms of algebraic geometry, and actually this is also quite standard. Okay. Uh, now uh, it is easy to compute this limit in this uh, in this situation. So uh, recall that uh, we have, sorry, uh, uh, recall that we have this, um, uh, these, uh, where, where, where were they? Yeah, uh, so uh, recall that uh, we have this, uh, tuple of uh, this this bunch of inequalities. So L0 is greater than all other exponents L, L1, Ln. And since uh, you know, these uh, entries in this line are just uh, projective coordinates, you can multiply them by one and the same multiple. Uh, you can multiply them by one and the same multiple. Well, maybe maybe I should even add one more line here. It will be more instructive if I'll add one more line. Let me do it. So this will come later. This will come later. And let me add one more line here. So if you multiply all the projective coordinates in here by t to the L0, then what you get? You get this. You get S0 prime of x s not prime s not double prime of x then t to the l1 minus l not s1 prime of x t to the l1 minus l not s1 double prime of x, etc. So finally, at the end, you get t to the ln minus l naught s n 
prime of x and t to the ln minus l naught s n double prime of x. I just have rewritten what was on the previous line by multiplying all projective coordinates with uh, t to the l naught. And now it is easy to compute the limit under uh, uh, when, when uh, t tends to zero. So uh, all coordinates uh, except the first two will vanish uh, when t uh, tends, uh, tends to zero because uh, here uh, t is taken to the positive uh, to the positive power. So what we get is that uh, we get s not prime of x s not double prime of x and zeros uh, everywhere else. Well, I have zeros. a question. Uh, yes, please. Well, why 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 don't we choose uh the s not uh why is the value uh the s the I think we should uh choose the value of s not prime at t t gamma x not at x. Uh, no, no, no. Everything is correct here. Why? Uh, but but uh, t gamma x, uh, uh, t gamma, uh, the image of, of t gamma x under five should uh, should be uh, uh, the coordinate uh, of t gamma x under five should be the value of s not prime. Uh, uh, so 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 your uh, your question is about this line. Your question is about this formula. I think the x here should be replaced with t gamma dot x. No, no. I mean, I, I mean, uh, well, uh, here, uh, here the formula is written correctly. Well, uh, I tried to explain this uh, by, by by this formula uh, and uh, before, uh, but um, uh, let me. <laughs> For the moment, let me postpone the explanation. Uh, if if you need more explanation, then let's discuss it maybe um, uh, after, after the lecture. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Because uh, uh, I guarantee that the formula here is correct. But if you need more details, then let me uh, let's take a few minutes to discuss after the lecture. Okay? Because otherwise, I'm afraid that uh, I, I I will not be able to finish the proof on this theorem today, which I want to do. Okay. Uh, here everything is uh, more or less by definition, but if you need more details, we'll we'll take some couple of minutes to discuss. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you agree uh, with this formula, then the next line is straightforward, and this limit is also straightforward, just because you take t to positive powers here, and when you uh, when t tends to zero, these guys also tend to zero. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, uh, this, um, I mean, uh, this, um, uh, this limit uh, is of this form, not everywhere, because it may happen that uh, the point x small is such that both of these two sections, s not prime and s not double prime, vanish at this point. And then, of course, this formula does not define any point in the projective space. So actually, uh, this limit formula holds uh, uh, on the open subset. Uh, this is true. This formula is true unless unless both of these sections, s not prime and s not double prime, vanish at the point x. If uh, these two sections vanish, uh, then uh, the limit will be different. But uh, we do we are not interested uh, uh, in this case. We are interested only uh, on this open subset where at least uh, one of these sections uh, does not vanish. Then uh, this limit formula holds true. And also, what does it mean uh, uh, in uh, coordinate-free terms? Well, you see, uh, you see that uh, this m star. Again, let me turn to, to the pointer. Uh, you see that this m star, m star, 
is uh, identified with the tensor product of V uh, lambda star with the two-dimensional vector space. Uh, and uh, uh, the vector with these coordinates is nothing but a tensor product of a vector in here and a vector in here. Namely, in here, you have to take a vector uh, from the dual basis uh, of these VIs. Uh, the vector which corresponds to, to V0 in the dual basis. So let me write on the next page. So uh, uh, in coordinate free terms, in coordinate free terms, uh, we can write that uh, 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 phi of T to the gamma x tends as t tends to zero. It tends to uh, the, the the point in the projective space spent by this line, v star tensor w, where uh, so this seats. Yeah, I mean, I will write it later. So uh, where V star sits in V of lambda star, and it satisfies the following. So V star paired with VI equals uh, one if I is zero and zero otherwise. So it is a vector in the dual basis. And W is some vector in K to, to the power two. So uh, this uh, form of the limit of the limit point uh, is explicitly that, uh, explicitly uh, means that uh, this limit point is of this, of this, of this form. And so this guy sits in the product. So W is determined by X, right? Uh, yes, of course, of course. Uh, this point is determined by X initially. So you start from a point X, small in big X, and you take this limit, and so you get this uh, this uh, this point in the projective space. So it sits actually in the product uh, of the two projective spaces, V of lambda star, and the projectivization of K2, which is just pi P1. Uh, and this product is embedded in the projectivization of M star uh, by the Segre embedding. Let me recall uh, what is a Segre embedding for you, if you don't know this. Segre embedding. Uh, Segre embedding uh, is an embedding uh, of the product of two projective spaces, say V and W, uh, not tensor product, just product of the two projective spaces, V and W, uh, to the project to another projective space, the projectivization of the tensor product of V and W, given by the formula that uh, a pair of points corresponding to a vector in V and a vector in W is mapped to the point in the projective in this projective space corresponding to the tensor product of V and W. So uh, this is a standard uh, map in the algebraic geometry, in algebraic geometry, and it is known to be a closed embedding. Uh, and what we have just seen, we have just seen that the limit point uh, of the uh, orbit uh, of this uh, 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 one project, uh, one parameter subgroup, the, the image uh, uh, of this one parameter of, of this orbit, this limit points lies in a sub-variety in this projective space, which is given by the Segre embedding. Okay, so, um, so what we have done 
finally. What, what, what we get finally? We are close to finishing the proof of the theorem. Uh, now, uh, what, what, we, uh, uh, what we have got finally? So since the variety X is projective, since the variety X is projective, Uh, this uh, uh, orbit of the one parameter subgroup uh, applied to X has a limit in X itself. So as t, uh, as t tends to zero, this uh, trajectory, this orbit, this curve tends uh, to some point in X. This is because uh, X is complete or projective, whatever you like, compact in classical terms. Uh, uh, by this means. And uh, the above calculation shows us that the image of this point, x naught, is exactly this point in the projective space, v star tensor w. Okay? This holds, uh, again, let me recall you that this holds for any x in the open subset uh, obtained by removing the vanishing locus of these two sections S not prime and S double prime. Outside this vanishing locus, uh, the limit formula holds and uh, this, uh, this equality holds on the open subset of X, okay? Uh, and and this, this guy is a dense open subset. This guy is a dense open subset in X. Uh, now, uh, let me consider uh, uh, yet another map from X to the projective line. This is a rational map from X to the projective line given by these two sections, S not prime and S not double prime. So this map sends the point X to the point on the projective line with these coordinates, S not prime of X and S not double prime of X. Uh, this map is non-constant. Just because Uh, these two sections, S0 prime and S0 double prime, are not proportional. They are not a multiple of each other. Because, uh, let me recall you, that uh, these sections are the images of the highest weight vector V0 in, uh, well, actually, because uh, these uh, two sections, S0 prime and S0 double prime, sit in two different uh, direct summons of M. So in M prime and M double prime, which are uh, uh, different double sum, uh, different uh, uh, direct summons of M. So the vectors from here and from here cannot be proportional, okay? Uh, and this means, this means that this map is non-constant. Uh, hence, since this map is not constant, Uh, the image of X under phi, it is a closed projective subvariety uh, in, uh, in this uh, projective space P of M star. The image of uh, X uh, under phi uh, contains uh, the points of the following form. Yeah? Phi is the projection, right? Uh, well, phi, uh, you may say it is a projection uh, uh, from how it was constructed, but uh, actually this is uh, not important so far. It is just a morphism uh, from X to this projective space. A morphism corresponding to the choice of this subspace M in the space of global sections of the line bundle L over X. Go on, go on. Okay. 
So uh, this image, uh, phi image of X contains uh, the points of the following form. Uh, you take this point V star, V star in brackets, uh, in this projective space, um, P of V of lambda star, and take any point on the projective line, P1. Uh, this sits in, in this uh, pro product of two projective spaces, P of V lambda star, cross P1, which is embedded in the projectivization of uh, P of M star by Segre. Okay. Uh, well, uh, why uh, phi of X is, uh, contains the whole image, uh, the whole, uh, this whole product variety, this whole projective line, you can say. This whole projective line, because this is just a point, this is a projective line. Well, because we have computed that uh, um, the image, well, we have computed here that the image of X naught is of this form. Uh, this V star uh, uh, tensor with W, where W is some vector in K2, uh, and uh, uh, an observation that this rational map is non-constant means uh, that uh, uh, this W actually, or maybe better to say, uh, the point in P1 corresponding to this vector to this vector W ranges over an open subset of uh, P1 because this map is not constant this pair of coordinates can be almost arbitrary and running over open subset of P1. Uh, so uh, phi of X contains an open subset in here, but since phi of X is closed, is a projective subvariety, the image of a projective variety is also projective. Since phi of X is closed, it contains the whole projective line here. Uh, maybe uh, it would be instructive to uh, to uh, to draw a picture. We, we have almost finished the proof, but uh, let me draw a picture. So how all these things look like? Let me draw it for you. So you have this X, your variety X. Uh, you have a projective space. Excuse me, maybe I better do it differently. Like this. We have a projective space. Whatever this picture means. <laughs> what it means, of course, a projective space. Uh, this is uh, pi of M star, okay, uh, we have this map phi from here to here, uh, uh, also uh, in this pi of M star, we have the product of these two projective spaces, pi of V of lambda star and the projective line pi one embedded by Segrea, and if we take a single point in the first factor, this one, uh, v star in brackets. Then we get just a projective line sitting in here. So let me draw this projective line here for you. So this is, uh, let me be this one. This is this projective line. And what we have explained on the previous page is that uh, this projective line actually is contained in the image of phi. So let me indicate in red Maybe this would be the image of phi, phi of x. And we have this projective line uh, sitting in this uh, phi of x. Now, uh, let me again come back to the previous page and look at this formula. So uh, uh, the group G acts everywhere here. And of course, phi of x is G stable. So it contains the G span of this projective line. But when you act by G, 
uh, here G acts only on the first factor in this decomposition because uh, this comes from this um, tensor product decomposition uh, on the previous page, yeah? And in this tensor product decomposition, uh, G acts non-trivially on the first tensor factor. The action of G here is trivial because this is just the multiplicity space. So uh, this is the direct sum of two copies of V of lambda star, and G acts on these two copies. And uh, in this form, uh, the action on the second factor is trivial. So this means that G acts only on here. And when you take the G span of this projective line, you just take a G orbits, the G orbit of this point times P1. And this will be still in the image of phi. So we have this picture like this. So we have the G orbit. Maybe, excuse me, I would better write it like here. We have a G orbit uh, of this point, of this point V star in brackets, multiplied with the projective line. So we have an infinite family of G orbits. So uh, we get that phi of x contains this product variety, what I just have said, this product variety, which gives you an infinite family of G orbits. Infinite family of G orbits. And by this we are done, because uh, since phi of x contains infinite family of g orbits, then of course x itself contains infinitely many g orbits. Just take the uh, orbits sitting in the inverse images of these orbits. So on x itself we have a picture like this. We have uh, infinitely many uh, fibers, uh, pre-images, pre inverse images of these orbits uh, under the map phi. Uh, and uh, they do not intersect, they are G-stable, they contain infinitely many G orbits. So still you have the open orbit, of course, the open orbit Y is sitting somewhere here. But this infinite family of G and the image of this open orbit uh, will be the open orbit in here, of course. Phi of Y. Uh, and this infinite family of G orbits will lie on the boundary. So finally, we constructed an embedding of X with infinitely many orbits. And this gives us the contradiction with the initial, with the initial assumption. So contradiction. Uh, the contradiction with the initial assumption that, um, let me go back to the first page, uh, that uh, uh, any G embedding of Y contains finitely many orbits. So this contradiction proves the inverse implication, and so we, we are done. So the proof is complete. Okay, so I think uh, uh, I'll stop now. It's time to stop, by the way. Uh, and if you have, if you still have questions, then please ask your questions. Uh, I have questions. So yes, go ahead. A regular uh, a rational map from a projective variety to the projective line. Uh, if it is not constant, then its image is dense, right? All right. Its image is dense. Yeah. Uh, this is basic uh, geometry. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, this is again basic, basic uh, things from algebraic geometry. Because uh, the image, uh, the image uh, of uh, an algebraic variety uh, under uh, under a regular map or under a rational map uh, is just uh, is a subset in the target variety in the target variety. Uh, containing um, a dense open subset of its closure. Uh, but uh, since it is non-constant, there are not too many options for that. It may be either, the image may be either. By the way, since X is projective, the image is closed. 
So the image is clo is a closed subvariety in P or P in P1. No, I mean, sorry, sorry. It's a rational map, so it, it needs not be closed. But anyway, uh, the closure of the image uh, may be either a point or the whole projective line, right? Because uh, P1 is one dimensional. There are no other subvarieties. If it's not a point, if this map is non constant, then this means that uh, the closure of the image is a projective line. And uh, uh, the image itself contains a dense open subset of its closure. So that's why. That's why the image is dense. Okay. So about the action of lama on on five. Well, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. I remember you had question. This uh, this page, yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah. So let's look at this formula, for instance. And this uh, 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 this formula uh, uh, encircled uh, encircled in in red by this uh, red red line. So suppose that your G uh, let me maybe even draw something. So suppose that your G is just t to the gamma. Okay. Yes. And suppose and suppose that your x uh, suppose that your x that that, that your s the section S is one of these sections, which are uh, eigenvectors for this action. Yeah? Yes, yes. Now, so what you get? So you get that if you apply, if you apply a G to the value uh, of the section S at the point X, then you get to another point, to the point GX. To the, uh, you get to the fiber over another point. And uh, uh, the value of the shifted section uh, and yes. this uh, shifted I, I point. Just mean, uh, the, I just uh, mean uh, uh, you take value in another fiber, not the fiber at end. Yes, yes. So I but, don't see uh, but, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the coordinate in the bracket should be value at x because uh, it is the value at other fiber. Um, it is the value at other fiber, but you can get to the initial fiber. Uh, you can beg, uh, get back to the initial fiber uh, by applying G inverse. The ratios, the ratios will be the same because when you um, when you compute the coordinates in the projective space, you need only the ratios of the coordinates, right? You do not need the values the of the, be the same. The uh, ratios will be the same because uh, the action is linear. S i and S j correspond to different g, I think. Oh. Uh, S i and S j, uh, so S i and S j are uh, how to say correspond they are to, uh, correspond to the same g. Uh, oh, no, no, they, they, they are not. They, they do not depend on g. They are just the fixed basis of m. Well, I, I don't. Are... I don't. I'm not saying they depend on g. Uh, I I'm saying uh, if you uh pull them back to the uh, initial fiber, uh, you, use, uh, you use the same G or the different G. If you use- No, no, the same, G. of course, the same, this one. Oh, so we, we same, analyze- the ratio does not change, uh, I mean. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I we oh, analyze so. the action of a fixed element of this one. And and uh, uh, this action is given by this formula and you can, yeah, you can you can shift back by to the fiber, uh, to the initial fiber by G inverse. So, um, so what? <laughs> uh, no, the problem is solved. No, no more questions. The problem is solved. Okay, okay, good. So, more questions, comments? Maybe I, I can say a few words about this theorem. Uh, uh, this theorem, as, as, you, as you have seen, uh, this theorem is non-trivial. At least uh, it took us the whole lecture to prove uh, the theorem completely. Uh, and also this theorem is important, uh, first because it gives uh, us yet another characterization of spherical homogeneous spaces in terms of, of embeddings, in terms of this finiteness property of all embeddings 
of a, of, of a homogeneous space. Uh, and this finiteness property is actually important in some questions like analyze, like enumerative geometry on homogeneous spaces. I hope we'll see uh, this kind of questions later in my course. Uh, but uh, let me just announce that uh, this theorem will play a role in this kind of questions. So, so despite that it is interesting by itself, I, uh, I think mm -hmm. it is also important for applications. Uh, so, um, uh, for the next lecture, let me make a, a, an announcement for the next lecture. Uh, uh, on the next lecture, I will start, uh, 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 I will turn to, uh, to classification of spherical varieties. So, maybe you remember uh, uh, from one of my previous lectures that uh, I told you the classification problem divides uh, in two parts to classify all spherical homogeneous space, and secondly, to classify all spherical varieties containing a given spherical homogeneous space as the open orbit, that is to classify uh, open embeddings uh, of a given spherical homogeneous space. And I will address the second problem uh, on, the, uh, on the next lecture on Wednesday. Uh, uh, I will make the first steps uh, toward this uh, classification. So this was this is the announcement for for Wednesday. And uh, if you have more questions, then please go ahead. Tell me if uh, anything is still unsolved so far from this lecture. So it seems that there are no questions so far. Maybe you have to digest this material uh, a bit more and you, you'll, uh, you'll come to questions later. Uh, if you have questions, then please write me on email or you may ask your questions uh, on the previous or on the next lecture. Uh, but maybe... Uh, to let me think about the answers, uh, it's better to write me on email if you will have questions on, on today's lecture or maybe on some previous lectures. So I invite you to, to write me and to discuss uh, by email exchange, whatever, whatever you want to ask. So um, let me stop sharing now. If there are no more questions or comments, uh, I say goodbye to all of you and uh, see you on Wednesday. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you for the lecture. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.